Hi, welcome to our platform series with Andre and Julian. In our last video, we talked about the seven questions that you can use to evaluate network effects mode. Today, we will be talking about how to solve the chicken and egg problem of multi-sided platform. Yes, finally. It is often the toughest hurdle for founders of marketplaces and other network effect businesses. And most startups never get past this stage. But since we are seeing many successful ones, many must have found ways to solve it. And in fact, there are many resources online sharing about the different hacks and different approaches. For example, here is the 19 tactics from NFX on how to solve this problem. So, Andre and Julian has grouped all the hacks that they have seen into four broad categories. And today, we will be discussing them so that you understand the underlying principles of these hacks and it might help you uncover new variations to apply to new and different circumstances. So let's start with the first category. Yeah, so maybe I'll start with that. Um, and just to note, you know, the reason why we group them in this way is we're, like we're trying to understand the general principle behind, you know, all these different hacks. There, there are many, many different um, lists of, you know, different methods you can use to solve the chicken and egg problem. And we thought, you know, if you look at all these different methods, you can actually see there are some underlying principles. So the first one, which we call the single side mode, the idea is like you want to attract initial base of users on one side by making them willing to join, even if they expect there's no one else, you know, or, or very few users on the other side. That's the principle that you're trying to use. You're trying to get people on one side, even though they might not expect anyone else to be there on the other side. And there are a few ways you can do that. An obvious way is just pay users to join, right? And that's what PayPal did in the early days. You know, give you some money, you get a PayPal account, you've got money in there already, and then obviously you need to spend it, you want to spend it. So that's going to create a demand for, you know, on the other side. And, and similarly, Uber, you know, rather than trying to get drivers and riders to somehow join when there's no one on the other side. They just pay people to drive around uh, in San Francisco, drive around in cars. And so that now they have supply. And then when people want to call Uber, there will be some cars available. So there's a kind of idea of just simply paying or hiring for users on one side. Yeah, I mean, there, so there's a few others, right? So pay, paying, hiring, I mean, the other options would be like, you can offer some sort of like free service. So you say, okay, come to my platform, not necessarily because you expect to interact with someone else on the other side, but hey, like I'm giving you some like interesting information service or something like that. So I think an example we had was um, Credit Karma, which is a platform that matches people with potential lenders. So they have basically, you can go as a person, you can go there and just check your free credit score, which you know has standalone value. Or even more clearly, what you could do is just offer. So instead of saying, I want to become a marketplace, but I'm going to start by offering a standalone product or service to one side. So in a good example would be um, uh, was Open Table. So Open Table, you know, two-sided platform between restaurants and users. But when they first started, for the first year at least, there was it was just a point of sale system, like a more software system for restaurants to manage their reservations. There's nothing for users. They just focused on getting a lot of restaurants to use their system. And then later on, they turned into a two-sided platform. Yeah, so obviously, if you offer a really good uh, standalone product and at a, a low price point, or sometimes even give it away, then you know you're really going to attract th those users on one side. Now, of course, sometimes that's not a necessarily a deliberate strategy. You might just be offering a product to one side and building up users on that side, and then you realize, well, actually, there's another side I could I could uh, bring in here and give access to these users. So that then you know goes into the whole issue of like. You know, you're starting with a product and you turn into a platform. But here, what we're really talking about is like you have a deliberate strategy. You know, you want to build this two-sided marketplace and you deliberately offer a product to one side first to get them on board. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, it's the, um, you, call it, you know, you want to be a platform when you grow up, but you understand that it's difficult and you start. I mean, I, I think this is a lot of advice that we've seen, like some VCs look at this and say, like, I'd rather you just focus on offering a product or service because the chicken egg problem is very difficult. And, you know, if all else fails, but at least you have a product. That's interesting. Uh, what's the next one? The second one would be, we call it like bring your own demand or I guess bring your own supply. So the idea here is, let's say you're, try, you're trying to create a marketplace, buyers and sellers, instead of just trying to get buyers or just trying to get sellers, you're getting both at the same time. You could, for example, go to sellers that already have their own buyers and then some, somehow get the sellers 
to get their own buyers onto your platform. So a good example that we have, just give you an example here. Uh, there's a startup called Playbook, which essentially it's an online marketplace for fitness classes, online fitness classes. So, and, and their trainers, the, the trainers that provide those fitness classes are actually relatively well known. They're kind of celebrity trainers. They have like very big Instagram followings. And in fact, their strategy for getting, you know, getting the marketplace started was to go to these inf- like where trainer influencers and essentially give them incentive to say, you know what, bring, so you come onto our platform, but bring your, you know, your current clients or your Instagram followers onto our platform. So that basically when they get, so they get the suppliers, the, 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 the fitness trainers, each fitness trainer is also bringing some demand to the platform. And then from there, the idea is like, let's say a fitness trainer brings their own, uh, brings their own clients or Instagram followers. The idea is like once they're on the platform, they can discover potentially other fitness classes. So they're already registered, they're there, and you get the ball rolling that way. And the, and the way this works, I mean, how do you incentivize suppliers to bring on their own customers? I mean, you have to offer them some tools, right? So you're going to offer them some software or some tools that allows them to manage their customers more easily. So in this sense, it's a little bit similar to offering a standalone product. But here, you know, the, the key difference is when you get the suppliers who come on, they're bringing their buyers with them. Whereas in the previous version, you know, you first offer a product to one side, but they're not bringing their other, you know, they're not bringing their users on. You have to go out and get those as a you know, separate operation. So the first one, you actually still have to do the work, right? I mean, you still have to go, okay, well, there's a second time to go after them. This one, in some way, yeah, you're leveraging one side to bring the other side. I guess here, the challenge is a bit different. It's exactly what you said. It's you do need to convince the suppliers that bringing, I mean, if I'm a supplier, right, I may have some, maybe I have some reservations about bringing my customers onto your platform because I may worry, like, I don't know, you're going to, what, you're going to take my customers and sell them to other suppliers or something like that. So I guess you have to offer enough value basically to say, if you, listen, if you bring your customers onto our platform, you're just going to be able to interact in a much easier way or like I'm going to lower your transaction costs or something like that. Yeah, is there a certain type of service or, you know, value that's created for such, you know, people who are bringing the demand onto the platform that it's a bit more appropriate? Because as you know, you need to have, the whole point of bringing them onto the platform is that you allow, say, allow them to find new people or you want to leverage I mean, the demand that they have brought in to create new connection, therefore, then you become a marketplace, essentially. Because if not, you're just providing tools to the supplier to use, right? So that's the, I think that's a very key, I think Julian and I emphasize this quite a lot. I think it's very important to realize, I mean, I understand most people think about marketplaces, the first thing that they do is discovery. But first of all, that's not, so you can have a very good marketplace that offers more than just discovery. And in, so discovery means I just find, you know, whatever, I'm a buyer, find other suppliers and vice versa. But a big part of the value of the marketplace is once you found, let's say I'm a buyer, I found the supplier I want to interact with is like, what do you do in order to make it easier for me to interact? So you can still have like a lot of value in terms of network effect and everything without actually having discovery. Of course, if all other things equal, I want both discovery and the other, like we say the tools, but basically like tools that reduce transaction costs. But again, I think there's a lot of value to be added, even if you don't have discovery. And that's what we're emphasizing here. Like basically like the idea here is like the discovery in some sense, you set aside the discovery because, well, you don't have anyone yet. And you just rely on the, uh, you're just saying, okay, you already have customers. I'm not promising you to bring any, to give you any new customers now, maybe later. But what I do promise you is that your interactions with your existing customers are just going to be better if you conduct them on that platform. So the standard things would be, I mean, the most obvious would be making payments easy, which otherwise could have been a hassle for the suppliers to collect from their customers. You think about like fitness instructors. Uh, Another one would be scheduling that you provide for the suppliers that they can do all the scheduling easily. So these are two common ones. There's a lot of other tools that you can add on to improve those interactions, depending on the application. Yeah, I mean, like any of your like content creator type that have followers, which is what you're bringing your d- demand type of model is suitable for, right? I mean, you can uh, think of um, Scholar Site, which is, um, you know, they, they offer these cohort courses, which we taught on. Yes. Um, you know, in some sense, the instructors on those courses are bringing some of their own you know contacts yes in, into scholar site but scholar sites adding a lot of value in terms of you know providing all the tools for the cohort classes but then of course after 
you bring in your contacts and if all the other instructors are bringing in their contacts, then these contacts can discover other courses, you know, from other instructors on there and it becomes more like a marketplace. But initially, you know, we would be bringing in our contacts, potential students into ScholarSite because we want to use their tools, do the payment, to run the course, to get the feedback and all that kind of stuff. You want to talk about supply side? Yeah. You can apply the same method, right? I mean, the idea is to bring your own demand or you can say, bring your own supply. Like, So I think there's fewer examples of this, but I guess in B2B marketplaces, I'm sure there, I mean, I'm sure you can, you can think of examples in which, let's say you get a customer, a business, and so there'll be the buyers and you say, well, you have a lot of suppliers. Well, come and conduct all your, let's say your, all your RFPs and your transactions with your suppliers. You know, why don't you come conduct them on our, on our platform? Because it's just going to be easier. And then that just helps us to onboard at the same time, the buyer and their suppliers. And then later on, of course, they can do that. I can do the same. Now I have a bunch of buyers and suppliers and I can enable some discovery among them, but it works in a very similar way. And Andre, you had Fair Market as one example. Is that right? Fair Market is a, so it's a B2B company. And uh, I actually think they're, they're based in Boston. So they do, essentially, it's like a business, so businesses that don't want to do procurement for non-essential supplies. And yeah, so it's a marketplace for those. And I think when they when initially when they started, that was a big part of their strategy is to go to large companies and say, hey, uh, why don't you come and do like, so initially it was basically like, you should do all this process through which you request, you know, products and you you uh, you manage your, your vendors, uh, just come and manage them on our platform. And then once they had a bunch of, and of course the vendors that serve one buyer may be serving other customers, right? So they'll go like a little bit ping pong between the two. So Start with start with customers. They bring a bunch of vendors. Then for the vendors, say, hey, which other customers are you serving? Then we bring the customers that brings more vendors and so on. Another one might be uh, Demand Star, um, which is oh, yeah. right local governments. And again, it's requests for proposals, and so the the local governments can bring on their vendors and suppliers <laughs> onto the onto the platform um, because they want to manage them through their. You know, they might maybe they have a better. So auction mechanism for the determining the winning bidder and things like that, which they can do on the platform. And once they bring on these uh, suppliers, then, you know, then they, of course, they can do exactly what you said uh, in the case of fair market. If it's a frequent purchase, you know, kind of thing, do you think that's a better thing? Or is it more about, you know, uh, having discovering new, you know, new varieties and new products and smaller businesses, you know, kind of buying from them uh, that it's actually more appropriate? I think it makes easier yeah. if frequent so like having a frequent relationship i mean it makes it easier to basically offer the initial value to bring your own demand bring your own supply but again ultimately the idea is that i'm going to enable some discovery as well yeah so i was yeah. going to say you actually want both because you want the frequency so you can get them on you know there's a reason for them to join in the first place because you're going to provide yeah. uh, something for their existing customers you're going to provide a better experience but then you also want discoverability so you need some new some new uh, transactions, right? So that yeah. you can add more value with your platform later on. But for strict yeah. purposes of the chicken and egg problem, yes, for bring your own demand or your own supply, frequent interactions or repeat transactions, that's good. That's an indicator that that's, this strategy might work. Right. But the, the limitation of this strategy is if it's only frequent, like repeat transactions with the same buyer-seller relationships, yeah. then, you know, it's not, not a particularly defensible kind of marketplace that you're building because you know it becomes easy to switch uh suppliers could just move over all their bias to another marketplace if it's offering better terms so you that's why you do want to add this discoverability at some point uh so yeah. that you kind of help to create some defensibility Agreed. in this business context itself that's when you know they need to like you said add on other functionality and features that you know increase um that better streamline the process itself and therefore the reason is might not be as much for discoverability but more about digitization of the businesses as well because of- i mean you can do all those things and those are going to help but ultimately if you don't have any any sort of discoverability then you're always going to be competing with other exactly. firms that are also offering those same products which are not that hard to offer eventually right like the technology is not that difficult so there'll be other firms also offering the same digitalized services and because it's easy for any supplier just to switch over if they can bring all their buyers with them so that's where you know they want to stay on there because they discover new, they get new clients on your marketplace or they want to stay on there because maybe their data uh, is 
somehow embedded in in your system for you become a like a system of record for them yeah so that they the switching cost for them to move everything over so yeah. either one of these could give you defensibility yeah so. I, I do feel that for the b2b business perspective like the whole key thing for them especially for small to mid-sized business the system of, re- of record is actually a big thing for them they're not like bigger companies that could easily afford the migration of the system of record and data which actually really is really important for them and that's when uh, I, I do think that from the b2b perspective that, that is actually much a bigger criteria and value for them sure that makes sense right. but, i yeah, mean if you think about the consumer side like if another just think of um the example of playbook with fitness instructors or maybe scholar site with instructors you know um for courses cohort courses you know if another platform comes along and we're the ones who have all the connections that we have all the clients or customers we can just shift them over to the better platform uh, but what what would keep us with scholar side or the fitness instructor with playbook is you know we actually rely on them to get new customers right to find new people to teach yeah uh, that's right. and, that, and that's a very real sort of source of defensibility as well yeah or okay, yeah or it could be like if it, so in the in the more b2b context i mean i think you're right josephine in b2b context so i get it this for it's for the customers it's very valuable from the company's perspective from the platform's perspective if you can raise switching costs because whatever you've put a lot of data in that can even maybe let's say discoverability is limited but if your switching costs are high that works as well yeah i i, I think that that is the key thing for them and also the data on it because the aggregation and discounting when you volume buy procurement you know supplier certification all that stuff is uh, is probably more valuable as i think for a b2b player instead let's get to the third category we're not going to offer value to one side, right? And you can't get suppliers to bring your their own buyers, then, well, you can just fake it. Um, so you can fake one side, which basically means make it seem like you have users on one on the other side. And so, you know, say buyers think there are a lot of suppliers there, they may come on and put in their requests uh, because they think there's plenty of supply available. So the idea is, well, there's a bunch of ways you can fake one side. A common, fairly common one would be to sort of manually fill the supply so you don't actually have a whole lot of suppliers you ask the buyers to put in their request and then you go out and you find the supplier and you know typically when we go to a marketplace and you don't actually see the suppliers listed you just say you know put in your request we suspect often those are cases where they are faking one side because you know they don't actually have a whole lot of suppliers they have to go and find them but in the process of you know they have people looking for stuff and they go to suppliers and in that process they will get new suppliers coming on board and build up their supply side so what do you mean you mean like those uh, sites that say uh oh, submit your requests and then yes. you will get a quote you know in, yeah. uh, you get three quotes when you submit your request kind of thing yeah get three quotes from our mini you know diverse range of great suppliers and actually there's no one there they go out they have a quote they go out and find the supplier so you know that if you think about the early days as extreme examples consumer examples would be like doordash um you know they put they actually put up menus of restaurants which of course you know you can anyone can get a menu put it on their website uh, people start ordering for delivery well they went they didn't have any relationship with the restaurant they just went and picked up the food bought it themselves and delivered it themselves that's how they started but you know when you went to their website you didn't know that you just thought you could you're ordering from the restaurant and then some person was delivering it just like it works now okay I mean, so i think it's important to to mention here right so when we say fake one side i mean there's two versions of this there's the truly lie like outright lying about it and like being like kind of deceptive so like a good example an egregious example of this oh yeah offer up so this was a competitor to craigslist in the us so classifieds so sure like the interface is much nicer than craigslist but so again you can just list your one account sell your couch or something like that and i actually tried to use it like just two or three years ago the problem is so you know you list stuff and you would actually get like i would get almost like within a couple hours, I would get some like in- inquiries about it. But then the messages would stop. Like I, I would reply and then there would be no further messages. And it took me like, took me about two weeks to realize, well, actually these are like bots. And I strongly suspect that what OfferUp was doing, they have these bots or basically go list stuff and they have this bot. Be, I mean, obviously the bot is not going to buy the stuff from you because, well, that's, but they would have the bot and probably provide some like random reply to make you think, oh my God, there's a lot of activity. When in fact, there's no one on the other side. So that's just outright lying. And I think that's, that one's dangerous because basically like people can figure it out, right? And it's just like, I'm just getting messages, but then no one's following through. Like I'll just get pissed off, right? And I'll say, I'm never coming back to this website. Versus the more, let's call it like, I don't know, entrepreneurial, like fake it. Um, 
So in the case of DoorDash, again, it, like in some sense, you don't care that restaurant doesn't participate. I ordered the food and the food came. Like whether like they actually delivered or it was like came from the restaurant, like I mean, it came from the restaurant that I ordered it from and I got what I wanted. So that's fine. So, you know, there are other examples of this where basically, you know, uh, there was, oh yeah, there was this language marketplace that we found. So we listened to a podcast and the founder was saying, um, so they had like English tutors when people, they want to learn English throughout the world, right? And he was saying initially, the only English tutors that were on the website was him and his co-founder. So yeah, you would go there as a student, you'd say, but again, you're getting an English tutor. So it's like, it's faking, but you get what you thought you were. So that, I think that's okay. Versus the, you know, the offer up, which is, which is misleading. And there's a, obviously a continuum in between those two. And, you know, often if you're listing on your website, you have thousands of suppliers, but actually you don't. Right. And that I think is somewhat common for they want to look that, you know, the platforms want to make it look like they have a, a liquid market. They have a lot of suppliers. They are going to do it themselves. They're going to manually fulfill demand, but, you know, they don't actually have those suppliers. So it's somewhere in between the, the completely fake and the, the legitimate approaches. But as you said, you know, post uh, Alibaba self-created, gen, you know, generating some activity and buzz, you know, on the marketplace, you know, to create a perception that something yeah. is going on. I mean, it's a bit same like the bot too, isn't it? Because in some way, the no, bot is thinking no, you of uh, but, but, something but, going on. But I think that's, a, there's a debate. I think that's the difference I'm talking about. So actually, Alibaba, I think that's fine because again, they're not promising you something that it's not. Like, you, I mean, they just, they generate activity, which is legit activity. Like, even though it's legit activity, it's just, them buying from each other right it's like the, 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 the company but, but that's legit like it's actually like paypal had this too by the way like they got everyone in the company to open a paypal account and do transactions to one another to say hey we have like all this like money that got transferred on paypal last month that's fine like it's it's legit i mean of course then you can miss misrepresent or something but i still think there's a difference between that and the really annoying bots i mean this would be like i think the dating websites do this too where like they create like fake profiles and then you try to talk to them and at some point just figure out there's nothing behind it i mean that's annoying right i mean just like people so that was dangerous because people will leave like once people figure it i mean you have to be stupid like after what i probably realized you will just leave you know i watched that movie on netflix i think what is it the clickbait right and uh, it said that actually dating website actually buy all this they can buy all the dating profile from some old database to use yeah. That's essentially is in your categorization faking one site, isn't it? You can buy lots of fake dating profiles from well, some database. Right, and, and that's what Andre is like. saying is, you know, it's it's more like the bots, right? It's the extreme version, which is not. Yeah, that was- it's a dangerous strategy. You risk turning off customers. Yeah, um, okay. I think Alibaba, Alibaba and PayPal did. It doesn't risk turning off customers because these are legitimate transactions. It may risk. It's a bit shady when it comes to investors, right? If you're telling investors I have all this activity and actually the activity is just you guys buying from each other. That that to me is a little bit shady, but um, from the customer's perspective, it's fine. So the yeah. restricting, I think there was one hack from the NFX one, which is like restricting the activity to a time constraint period so that it looks like perception that there's you know a lot of players you know in the market kind of thing. Was what would you categorize that as? But that one is not necessarily to make it appear. I actually think there's a very good. So let's say especially initially when you don't have a lot of supply and a lot of demand, it's not just to make it look like it's liquid. It's actually to make it liquid. So I'll give you an example, the the language tutoring one, right? Well, let's say initially you have like, I have five tutors, like whatever, I have three or four tutors and mm-hmm. there's like people from all around the world. And by the way, this has to be, it's synchronous. It's not like I go and schedule something. The idea here, this is like the Uber of language instruction. So like, I wanted to, I want to have a 10 minute conversation to practice my English right now. Well, if you just let people choose their schedule throughout the day, the chances that the tutor, the, those five tutors are going to be matched, they're going to be there, is like it's very small, like it's very low. So what they do is like they say, this is only, this service is only available between, I'm going to make it up, 9 and 10 p.m. Eastern time. So mm-hmm. what you're doing is like, again, you're narrowing down the window. And I know like I've talked to tutors, they're available. Like during that hour, they have to be available for any call that comes through. And yeah. then customers know like, if I want, I'll just go there. Well, that actually maximizes liquidity. Yeah, it's not just giving the impression, it's you actually making it happen. So there's lots of examples like this. Yeah, and I think that one's totally legitimate. And indeed, you may even want to do that if it's a synchronous type matching, you might even want to do that forever, right? Even when you have a lot of liquidity. If you think about stock markets, they typically 
have a window in which they're open for that reason to maximize liquidity. Yep. So therefore, what you're saying was that Uber in the beginning hire one side because they needed to match the liquidity, and that's the reason why they fa- um they they hire one side the they hire the supply yeah, I mean, if, side if, in the beginning. If, that's right. If Uber says, "Well, we're only going to have drivers between nine and ten o'clock," then it's going to be a very desirable service for most people. So they yeah, they don't um, have that choice of narrowing the window. Actually, they, no, no, actually, they need to hire people. No, no, but actually, they did that. So again, just to be clear on Uber, so the two are not mutually exclusive. Actually, the two work together. What Uber did initially, they hired people, and they, they're not going to pay them like for to drive around for the entire day. That would be crazy. What they did, this is my understanding, they hired them and said, "You're going to drive between." the hours of 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. in this particular area in San Francisco. Why? Because that's when people come out of bars and clubs. And they told people, like, if you come out, like, you can open the app during those times, not like at, like, not at 9 a.m. So yeah, the two work together. Of course, like you definitely want to do that initially. Of course, later on, they, they want to, the drivers to become available. Like you want availability throughout the day. But again, this is very important, like initially, and at some point, so not in the case of Uber, but in other examples that we've seen, it still makes sense to keep it, you know, keep it constrained for certain for certain hours. All right, interesting. So the smart way is to actually supply the point, the peak hours or the time when they know that supply is very constrained and very limited where they serve the most purpose and actually fake one side in some way or hire one side in some way to match the demand at that point to make it you know, known uh, to people, right? What the value proposition is basically to find you know, cabs when they need one. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, and it brings up another useful point, um, which is you should, yeah, you should definitely shouldn't think of any of these as mutually exclusive. In fact, if you think about the very successful startups of the last decade or so, they've used many of these different strategies together to get going, right? Like PayPal and Uber and so on. They they pop up many of the in Airbnb. They pop up in many different categories as examples. So, what about the last category? The last category is really to change people's expectations. That's the idea here. So you want to create favorable expectations in the sense that you want people to think that there's going to be a lot of lot of users on the other side. So it's not like I'm going to get a lot of users on the other side. I'm not going to say there's a lot of users on the other side. Um, I'm actually going to create the expectation. And so that people want to join, you know, given that they have that expectation. The example I would give here would be, you know, imagine setting up a shopping mall from scratch. And a shopping mall is a two-sided marketplace where you're bringing in the retailers and you're bringing in the shoppers, right? And um, and you say, how do you get that going? How do you convince, you know, the size to come on board? Well, in this case, you need to get the shops in first, obviously, before you open up the shopping mall. So how do you get shops to come in? Well, they have to believe that there's going to be a lot of people coming into the shopping mall. So how do you get them to believe there's going to be a lot of people coming into the shopping mall? Well, one way is you get an anchor tenant. So you get, you know, a tenant like a supermarket would be a, the most common example that, you know, everyone's going to come into the shopping mall to go to that supermarket. That's going to draw in lots of customers, lots of shoppers. So all these other potential tenants know that once I've signed up this anchor tenant, well, there's going to be lots of shoppers there. Yes, I want to sign up the lease for the shopping mall. So it's really just doing something to change the expectations about that this marketplace is going to have a lot of liquidity. In some sense, it's getting at the root of the problem of chicken and egg. So it's, it's basically, it's more of a problem of expectations than it's the reason you're not, you can't get supply and demand is because neither one believes like the other is going to come. But if somehow I, I do something that, you know, says like, oh, like this is going to be great, whatever. Like if I can convince everyone to expect that this is going to be great, it turns out expectations will be fulfilled. So shopping mall example is great. The modern day version of that, that a lot of companies use is, will be like on the blockchain is by, um, so they're issuing tokens, right? So they're saying like, you know, maybe you have marketplace, I issue tokens. And essentially, I try to convince people. So I try to give people incentives. Like if you join early, you get the token. And therefore, like, you know, if if this takes off, you're going to, you stand to gain a lot. You stand to gain a lot. So what are some additional advice, you know, as you can, you know, as you know, people are always asking, you know, which side first and people are always saying, you know, the more difficult side or should be supply side, you know. Other strategies that they're not really directly solving the chicken and egg problem, but they are additional strategies you can use conjunction with these other four uh, different types to improve things. I mean, some of them are a little bit about virality, but you know, not all of them. Okay. Yeah. So basically you need, I, I think just to be clear, I think these four that we talked about, again, at a high level, I think it encompasses pretty much 
everything you can do conceptually at least in order to solve the chicken and egg problem again not necessarily mutually exclusive you can use multiple and then so what we want to do is like go a little bit further and say well what else might you do that helps right but i think fundamentally you do need one of these four like at least one of these four because otherwise you just haven't haven't solved the, the issue right. a lot of the lists that you see out there with strategies to solve the chicken and egg problem they mix up solutions that are from one of these four different methods that we've been through and mm -hmm. other other things you could do which are not really about solving the chicken and egg problem they're just general strategies that you can use to obviously get more marketing right like free press but they would not be enough they would not be enough on their own right i mean i think right. that's the key is like on their own this would not be enough so let's say I mean, we give some examples, for, for instance, like one that we give is like, you know, give, so do some clever marketing that gives the impression of exclusivity. It's like join that, like, I don't know, something like Clubhouse did initially, right? It's like, it's only, it's invite only, and it's, you know, basically like, you know, it's whatever, it's on, on the iPhone. Well, that's great. And I'm sure that it creates some, like, you know, people kind of like, was a fear of missing out and stuff like that. Yeah. But by itself, that's not going to cut it, right? I mean, you still need to, I need to give some incentives like, okay, why do I want to be there in the first place? So I think the answer in the case of Clubhouse was probably something like bring your own supply or demand. So like you, they got very famous people to go and create rooms and people would follow them there. Well, in some way, yeah, some of them, as you said, right, it, it is some form of uh, creating virality, you know, and that's when you said also that's where the confusion comes in, where people mistaken these tactics of creating virality you got to do with, you know, some form of the network effects, right? Um, and it's, in, it's probably good also that people, you know, use some of these tactics to sort of create virality at the end of the day because you want to get on board a lot of the different players quickly on both sides right and getting the sides are really important for the liquidity at, at the end of the day to happen yeah i mean you can think of it as yeah these other ways of speeding up the process once you've sort of got this uh, strategy to solve the chicken and egg problem but now you want to speed that up want everything to happen faster um, then you can think about all these other things you could do like referral programs getting free press you know there's a bunch of things that are fairly obvious one thing that's a bit specific to the sort of two-sided marketplace would be getting users who can be on both sides at the same time which you know obviously helps right if you have user who can both be a host for airbnb and also a guest you know having more of those is going to speed things up just to re-emphasize that that's a really good idea and it, it works but by itself is not enough right i mean it's not like you can trade with yourself so like you still need to get a few people there is a pretty important question that comes up so we, we have all these strategies we say we'll get one side or get the other side but let's say for example when we say provide standalone value to one side i think it's important to ask well which side to focus on first right if you decide to basically go and get one side first and i think general advice for marketplaces like in general the answer tends to be the supply side for pretty obvious reasons like they're typically they're smaller in number they kind of it's just easier to con to convince them you have to have something there like if you make it easy enough for, let's say for suppliers to say like i'm not asking you to do anything i'm not asking for a fee just like i want to make it very easy for you to list just so i can have something to show buyers so i think typically that logic works um i'm sure there are exceptions like I'm, there are exceptions to this if for example it is very easy like maybe it's super easy to offer some standalone silly service to buyers, right? Like, I don't know, maybe you can come up with something like so easy to offer to buyers. It's just like, I don't, I don't need suppliers. So an example of that would be HipCamp, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. HipCamp is a marketplace for outdoor, you know, private campsites. But, you know, how do they get all these private, you know, uh, farms and, and outdoor locations to list their, their places? Well, they actually got the buyers first. And the way they got the buyers first is they listed all the public camping sites, which turned out to be like, you know, run by all the different, um, you know, states um, in the US. And so it was a real hassle for buyers to book those. And, you know, the booking systems are all different and a lot of them were not very functional. So they just provided that service for buyers so they could book public campsites easily. Uh, and that, of course, brought in all the buyers. And then suddenly you have all these buyers who are also interested in, you know, often the public campsites are booked out. So they're interested in finding alternatives. And then you can bring in the private uh, sure. providers. So there's always, you know, there can always be some specific factor, which like that hip camp example, which is, you know, it just turns out it's much easier to get one side first 
because you can offer the standalone value or you can do something uh, specific for them. And then you, that's the one you go for, right? Just, it turns out in most cases that suppliers, right? It's easier to offer software or some tools that the suppliers need. And the suppliers are the ones who are usually more desperate um, and from a buyer's point of view, they're only interested if there's a lot of variety. So that's kind of why you need suppliers first. Yeah. What is interesting is that because you said like, you know, that's what they do. You should be a zigzag set strategy, right? And then if I'm hearing you correctly, you know, they list the public side first, but the whole idea of that tactic is to get the, you know, the demand side of the, you know, campus, you know, but actually ultimately that's the one side they want. And then they onboarded the other, you know, people that has, you know, the whatever. And that's where I think that I feel that a lot of the startup when they started and pitch, right, they they might pitch the tactic without knowing that actually that's just the the bait to get, you know, the the one side, you know, and but the big picture is really this two side that they're actually trying to build. Um, I find they usually started something but it's not like the full picture yet, you know, of both sides, but they just thought there's something there, but not complete yet, the whole value chain. And I, that's what yeah. I find. Well, I mean, we're talking about solving the chicken and egg problems over so like really right at the start. How do you yeah. how do you get going? But definitely most marketplaces, you're talking about balancing demand and supply. So you're trying to get both, obviously. And once you get some suppliers, then you can get some buyers and uh, that'll help you get more supplies and so on and so forth. So that's, you know, zigzag strategy is usually what you're going to be using. You know, we've been going over where should you start, right? Right at the beginning. Right. I think this we talked a little bit earlier about this, right? I mean, I think it's pretty intuitive. So it could be narrow in terms of like time time frame if we're synchronous marketplaces, or it could be narrow in terms of product categories or services. But it's the same logic, right? Again, especially initially, you want to maximize liquidity. It makes sense to restrict like pretty narrowly. Once you get liquidity, you can start you can start adding. That also applies to locations, right? So yeah. Geography, you you want to start with a narrow geography typically. Um, you know, Uber is not going to start everywhere. It's going to start in, you know, certain part of San Francisco and then spread out from there. You know, yeah, I do know a startup. That, this is a really bad example. Actually, it's, it's really good. It's like there's very good reasons to start narrow and be very disciplined about it, right? So, like, I have an example of a startup that basically went national when they had, like, five suppliers in every city. That makes no sense. There's a reason, you know, there's a bunch of benefits of going the narrow approach first, Um Obviously, Andre mentioned building a liquidity first, and then you can actually offer some value and that'll attract users. And then your unit economics can be worked out, right? Is this a viable business or not? Because if you get liquidity and there's still, you know, you can't make money in this narrow area, then when you scale it up, it's just going to scale up in a bad way. You're going to be making more losses everywhere. So you need to get that sorted out first. And once you've sorted it out, then you can build a playbook. I know how to do this in this narrow area. Now I can apply this to other locations or I can apply it to other use cases. And that that becomes much more scalable and attractive to investors. For me, actually, that's the, one of the most important things, actually, because... Um, as you know, a startup, they are always uh, limited in time resources. The ability to focus really come from the deciding of the narrow and deciding of the location and how do you decide and, you know, the details. Because that ties back to your four categories, really, because that's when they're saying, okay, what is the tactic we're going to use to do this narrow, to make this narrow segment work? And then how does that work, you know? Again, obviously, I'm big on the whole execution sequence because everything has to lead to something that's easier to the next one, you know, and uh, deciding on the narrow segment and the right one to prioritize is actually uh, where I think you see when the startup talk about it, you see how much they really understand the market itself. You know, there's certain criteria to know whether there's a good enough market, you know, as a potentiality, you know, to why you want to start it and all, right? So, mm -hmm. but yet you still have people going very narrow and you don't know whether they're narrow is just because they're starting on one category first or that's what they thought is it. I think I'm trying to answer how would a startup know that this is probably meant to be more market, premium, premium market would be more appropriate than having a uh, electrician, you know, marketplace, for example. This is how I basically chart all marketplaces that I see. And these, I think, are two of the most important variables, which are basically frequency of usage, and it's specifically frequency of match. So while I might use my nanny every single day, I'm not matching with a new one every day. So it's really the frequency of, of the match and the size of the transaction. And this isn't your classic, you know, uh, two by two where you just want to be in the upper right. What this is, is really defining what type of marketplace you should build based on where you are in that uh, two by two. So things that are way on the right, super high frequency, things like taxis and meals, which is why we have Uber and Postmates and DoorDash or whatever's big here. And those 
models should all have a marketplace that has ultra low transaction costs. That's why it's uh, what I call a supplier picks model. I open an app, I press a button, it's first come first serve and it just happens very, very quickly. And then at the other extreme, you have things like buying a home, which is a, well, in San Francisco, it's a couple million dollars. Nobody wants an Uber for buying a home. You don't want to open an app, press a button, and you're out $2 million. Because there's no standardization, it's very custom, there's tons of different variables that go into it. And so what you need in, in that model is more of what I call a buyer picks uh, approach, which the buyer can scan and browse millions of listings, and you have things like Zillow, Zillow and Trulia that charge more on a lead gen model. And then you have all the things that are in the bottom left. And my opinion is that in those categories, verticals usually don't make sense. So that's where you get things like locksmiths and plumbing and handyman and carpenters. And I don't believe a vertical will work for any one of those things. I think you need to group them into a horizontal platform, which is why you have things like Thumbtack in the US that is by far now the largest uh, home service provider. So they, they have home services across 30 different categories. And I think that's the only way, because once you group those things, what you've effectively done is increase the frequency, because I can buy across 30 different categories. So I'm a big fan of that. The other one is OfferUp, which is uh, actually started with just baby and kid stuff. And the reason they started with that is because if you have kids, you know that you're buying four different strollers, two different cribs, a changing table, clothes you outgrow every three months. And so there's just naturally this very high frequency uh, going on in the baby and kids category, but that wasn't enough. And so very quickly, we grew out of that category and now have about 30 different categories. And it's literally everything, electronics, sporting goods, you name it. So if you're, whatever industry you're looking at, if it's in one of those things that's relatively low frequency compared to some of these others, I think you need to adopt a more horizontal approach. Um, and then you have the top right, which is sort of empty at the moment. Uh, this is where I think a lot of the opportunities are going forward. And you've heard a lot of people talk about B2B marketplaces. I think a lot of the, the high, high spend, high frequency things tend to be in the B2B cases. Uh, the challenge is they, they work a little bit differently and you can't take 30% all the time. But, but that's where I think a lot of the opportunities are. Again, the Josh, you know, his comment about certain marketplaces are meant to be broad because if you have just for plumbers, it's probably not going to work. You probably need like, you know, the whole imp home improvement marketplace that sort of work. Startups should think longer term because, you know, sometimes they choose a name it becomes rather restrictive because they realize after they've built this category, they can actually expand into, into other categories. But the yes. name is, is a, you know, like you imagine in pets, you know, and then your name is specific to dogs and now you can't do, you know, you can't do cat sitting. Yeah. Just to, just to give you another example, like eBay, you know, obviously they're famous for being very big in Beanie Babies when that was all the rage. And I think at some point that was a large part of their revenue. When they went public in their prospectus, they had a warning that, you know, they were exposed to the risk of any decline in the Beanie Baby market because it was such a big part of their overall transactions. But, you know, obviously the market will pull them in different ways and they don't really know which categories are going to be the big categories in the future. I, I say this example because OpenSea is an example, uh, which which is uh, similar to eBay, but it does, you know, marketplace for NFTs. They actually started without any focus. So they just opened up to any kind of NFT. So they didn't focus on one type and try and grow that type because they really didn't know what types of NFTs would be traded and where the demand was or where the supply was. Just to note, it's not always the case that you want to start narrow and build up from that. If discoverability is important, YouTube is another example, right? If discoverability of what people want and you know where the supply is is sort of key. Then you might actually just want to create the infrastructure and let let the sort of market. I mean, there's two ways. Grow. So there, it's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I would argue there that NFT, like you know, someone could look at this and say NFT is a is a <laughs> vertical in its own, right? Yeah, it is. But but of course, I mean, I think the idea, but I I think the idea it's like well, like YouTube, it's videos. But I think the point is like if it's such a big category, we know, like, this is just like, it's a new market. We know that over time, there's going to be many different verticals within it. It's just a new product category. And yeah. we know it's just, there's going to be a lot of it. So in those cases, I think it absolutely makes sense to be like essentially generic, yeah. but generic for that new product category, because yeah. we believe it's going to become like, it's, it's going to growing. become something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's I mean, you really don't know where. It's, I mean, the point that he, the founder of OpenSea made is they really didn't know where, which types of NFTs are going to be more important. So they don't want to just focus on, the obvious thing would have been to focus on like gaming or one particular category, but you right. know, you don't, you don't know, maybe art or something else. And it turns out art was the one that went first. Um, 
So similarly with YouTube, I think, right? Like who knows what kind of, what kind of videos people are going to come up with. If they had just tried to focus on one type of video, they might've missed the, you know, a lot of the very interesting stuff. Yeah. But I don't think it's a segmentation of the type of video though. I think the segmentation is what kind of creators though. Is it a company SMB yeah, creator? Is it is an individual content creators, you know, kind yeah. of thing? Um, I guess that's where the segmentation kind of thing uh, come in of who's the most likely to quickly put on videos, you know, <laughs> that is entertaining, you know, for everybody. So, I mean, I'm big into energy transition. So, and uh, work in companies in that space. So as you know, many new market categories and subcategories of suppliers and players will need to emerge uh, and be deployed to help achieve net zero by 2050. So I thought I'd choose a, um, a solar marketplace, solar panel marketplace as an example of a startup. And this startup actually wrote to us in response to your product to platform promise. So basically you want to get your house outfitted with solar panels. You, yeah. you, you say, okay, I want to find which supplier would be the best and have the best price and can do it as quickly as possible or whatever the other dimensions are. And again, that's an interesting one of um, how the different geography and location is going to make a difference, right? So first and foremost, uh, there is a customization of every house is different, right? And you need that location-based, you know, installation service. Second and foremost is that the product variety, the product manufacturer variety is quite substantial. They have brands, you know, from Germany and China. There are different configuration of it, you know, with the panel to inverter to battery to storage to maintenance of that process. The third one is the financing, right, which is a big part because of if you can help me finance at zero interest, and that will be a key critical path, I think, in certain market for affordability and access. The fourth one is this is where the geography come in again because each country also have certain grant and uh, 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 that you actually can apply and get credit for to help you finance the installation, right? So the complexity okay. comes from all these four areas. So this one I mean, is a good, good application. So not knowing what they've done to date, like actually it's a good one. So how would we solve the chicken and egg problem here? Can't you just, so this is like my first reaction to this is like fake one side. I mean, it's basically like you go to customer. So like customer says like, okay, so customer comes, okay, I want to retrofit my house. And they would basically have to say, okay, what do you need? And then they would have to go on the back end and talk to a solar provider. And, and, mm. I, don't know. and I think, I think that's what they do because I don't know these guys, but um, the other one I sent Josephine, oh, when you, when you click on the, when you go to their website and you, you know, I was like, okay, what are the suppliers here? Well, they just ask you to put in your request. Yeah. And so it is exactly what I was saying earlier. When you don't see any suppliers, you wonder maybe they don't have many or any suppliers. They just going to take your request. They're going to go to suppliers and but get it's fine. And, in, this, yeah. in this kind of case, I think it makes sense, right? Especially I think this is the kind of, I would say these are like larger projects. So like each individual transaction is actually pretty large. You know, there's, it's more involved. So it kind of makes sense also because they may want to learn like what the transaction involves. So I think instead of just trying to like, just have a bunch of listings in there, it just seems to me to make sense in this kind of context for them to be involved in the middle and do the, whatever the, I guess we'll call it the fake one side strategy, yeah. but in a good way, the fake in a good way, not the fake in a in shady way. And I find what you've put at Palmetto on is quite interesting because they are probably like fully fledged in really trying to accelerate because they even add their own sales people to help sell uh, to people who intend to install solar like you and then orchestrate the entire value chain with all the different players. I think this is what you just described. It's exactly what I had in mind precisely because it's a complex transaction. So it's not just like I go to the shopping mall and I buy XYZ from the shelf. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot of value here in someone aggregating the different components. That's why I think it makes even more sense to do this like very heavy involvement by the uh, by the company initially. And actually, like they kind of do most of the work. They would go and and so they would see what the the customer needs and turn around and and try to fulfill it from the from suppliers. And, and eventually, maybe they'll they'll list the suppliers that they think are good and they'll figure out how to how to recommend them. So would you match them or you actually do a lot more? That's what you call management. Like- I think you need to do a lot of manage, like basically like almost like not, not as, not too much like a marketplace initially. It's almost like you're, you're an aggregator. Ah, aggregate the different level of the, the product, the product. Yeah, you just, yeah, I just, okay. What do you want, Josephine, for your house? Okay, you want panels? Like, and I'll go and figure it out because it's, I mean, unless some people know what they want and it's just not easy work and then you can figure out, okay, 
this kind of combination for this price point works and then you can start like building a database of of eligible suppliers say so let me let me raise one difficulty with this fake take the supplier side um approach if, and i'm looking at this from a buyer's perspective right yeah i'll see a bunch of websites and they'll say enter your information and we'll find yeah. you we'll find you the great supplier of solar, yeah but I, I'm very skeptical, you know, I'm like, are what you really going to, I'm just going to waste my time, right? You're going to come back with some, how do I know you're actually going to have a good selection? You're going to get me the best price and so on and so forth. So if I don't see this choice that I can actually scroll through and look at, I'm, I'm always a bit skeptical. I think bias, you know, a lot, there'd be a lot of bias like that. And so it can work, but, you know, maybe you need to have some, some kind of guarantee that you're going to get the best price or there's something there that makes people convince them that there is actually something behind this, which is where the sort of changing expectations, creating the favorable expectations can come in. Like if I know that you have, at least you have like this key supplier that is the most, you know, the biggest one in the market or something, then that might change my expectations well. That's a good might. point. So it's almost like, yeah, you don't want it to feel like you're just going to the, whatever, the, the car repair shop and it's like, what like you know as they come up with some ra- some random price like you want to have some guarantee like you want to have some credible like some guarantee that there there's some comparison shopping so that's interesting that means like you actually would want to have some listings from the beginning right so you could, that that will make you feel more comfortable if they had some suppliers already listed in there what about getting a whale uh in the sense that partner with one wholesaler because now now we're tra- attacking because that's what i was going to ask you so how do they start because there's so many parts finance company, product companies, you know, in terms of the solar type and everything else, and then the supplier, which is a services component, right? Mm. How would you start? Because even this, within the supplier, there's different categories. Also, well, just getting, in this case, if I understand correctly, just getting, say, one supplier, like even whatever, like a very large and reputable supplier of solar panels, it's not enough, right? Because you need all the other things. Like in the case of a shopping mall, it's like you can get Macy's and that's fine because I'll go there just for Macy's. But here, I do need the financing. I do need the other the other components. So, so I, when I say get a whale, right? What I would want is to get a wholesaler because the wholesaler has all the different brands. So that's different. Okay, so uh, different brands of Product what? Brands. Of the panel. So, yeah. Okay. So then there's no competition, right, between the different products and the things like that. But you would, you would also need financing, right? So Yeah, I mean, but you got to focus on one side first, isn't yeah. it? I mean, like, you're, I'm, saying, you're saying getting a whale, getting a wholesaler that's going to bring on all the brands. But that's not, that's not really getting, a, that's not changing expectations. That's just getting all the supplies, isn't it? That's like, yes, yes, that's, that's a way of solving the supply side is yeah, to yeah, do it through, through a wholesaler rather yeah, than trying yeah. to do it. And that one works, yeah. But but then, then and then you onboard then then you onboard the services uh, installer in the in the location, no, through the certification process, promises of you know quotes. But I don't think for the services, I think they're fine. I mean, this is one where like I think they're okay. You just say okay, you need you get their contacts. It's not like they need to sit there and wait. You just get their contacts and say, hey, listen, if we have if we have projects, you're okay with us basically passing those pro like basically calling you up or something like to, we just want you to be available like on our website in case we have projects. Supply side. And just, but you don't have all of them, just a few, right? Just, you need to have enough. So like you get the whole, like the wholesaler is going to get you like the, the panels. You do need at least one, presumably one financing provider and then a few contractors to cover whatever area you're starting with. Okay. Yeah, I think one, one, going back to the first point about like, is there a reason that supply would want to come onto your platform for some standalone value? I think you mentioned like being able to handle all the issue with the uh, government subsidies, right? And things like that. Like you could actually build some tools around that that make it much easier for them because I'm sure that's a hassle for them. Like they have to yeah. make claims and get reimbursed. And like you could just even pay them up front because you know you're going to get this money and you and you deal with all that for them. Then it becomes very attractive to uh, I want to deal through this platform. Which is why I brought up the other player, in which is actually quite interesting. Because if you think about it, right, this marketplace is probably one of the, it's going to be a hot marketplace given the circumstances. Who is in the best position to actually gain substantial traction in this to enter right because there's so many players to add on first which side do i add right the uh, another company called brighty which is a solar financing company startup that started first with solving the problem of financing right and now and then they started having all the listing of all the installers 
around all the suburbs, right? And they onboard all the listing directory. And they just announced recently, like I said, they list, they're going to raise money and go on the stock exchange and they are going to become a retailer. And that was what I actually want to ask. That's quite interesting. Why do they want to be a retailer? Because that's like actually owning all the inventory. Because maybe they can sell it. Again, I think it comes back to what I mentioned at the beginning. I can see the value of retailer here because there's a lot of value in aggregation. This is very like, this is a very complicated product that you're buying. And there's a lot of value in someone basically taking care of the whole thing for you. As opposed to you, like what? Are you going to buy each part individually and figure it out on your own? There's a lot of value in someone saying, I'm just going to take care of everything, put everything together for you. you yeah, but why don't you just own the service orchestration, but don't own the inventory? Because being a retailer, in my understanding... Well, because you might be able to charge a higher price for the... You might be able to charge it. There's probably some arbitrage opportunity. You buy the, you buy the, uh, you buy the inventory wholesale and you sell it retail precisely if the customer doesn't really understand like you know like the, the different different parts but there's, there's also an option right like you could do the very managed marketplace model right which is gives you most of the benefits you know you can be even the one setting the price right, That's right. and um, taking care of everything for the customer but you're not holding the inventory you're just you know subcontracting that out to these wholesalers which is why I wanted to ask, but you always got, you always said, right, there's a spectrum. Which one should you be? Should you be a retailer? Should you be a reseller? Do you should you be a marketplace? And this is a this is the context I'm setting up to. Well, wow, actually, what would be a best model to use in this context? Yeah, so that part we don't know because we don't know enough about it. But certainly the part from you know just being like a pure marketplace to making reducing the frictions for the buyers that they can just come in there and they can okay. I want this and this and this, and then they can, the marketplace handles everything for them. So it's very managed. That part makes sense to us, I think, immediately for this type of product. But yeah. whether, whether they want to manage and own the inventory and so on, that we don't know enough about industry to say, but that's com- somewhat separate, I think. And which is why I think your example of the US Palmato one, I think they really have the best model with regards that fit um, that market itself. That's a managed is- marketplace, right? Yeah. yeah which is yeah, a managed exactly. marketplace. I think that's a highly yeah. scalable, best. I believe, I believe they're doing very well. Well, remember to subscribe to Andre and Julian's Substack as well as, you know, this channel if you want to be notified of new content. And uh, remember to share and like uh, if you have learned something from the video. It will motivate us to share more. And coming up, we probably will either talk about marketplace versus reseller or we might talk about internal network effects because I know you were saying something about internal network effects as a promise, I think. I'm looking forward to that one because I think that's suitable for B2B or B2B enterprise com- companies or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Reseller versus retailer. Huh? No, reseller versus marketplace. Marketplace versus resale.